Good morning. Let's see, it's time to start. <clears throat> we'll be singing No Tears in Heaven. No tears in heaven, no sorrows given, all will be glory in that land. There'll be no sadness, all will be gladness, when we shall join that happy band, and there'll be no tears. There'll be no tears, no tears of death. Sorrow and pain will all have flown. And there'll be no tears. There'll be no tears, no tears of death. No tears in heaven will be known. Glory is waiting. Waiting up yonder, oh, where we shall spend an endless day. There with our Savior, oh, we'll be forever, oh, where no more sorrow can dismay, and there'll be no tears. There'll be no tears, no tears of them. Sorrow and pain will all have flown. And there'll be no tears. There'll be no tears, no tears of them. No tears in heaven will be known. Someone in yonder. Oh, we'll cease to ponder all oh, things this life has brought to view. All will be clearer, save ones be dearer, in heaven where all will be made new, and there'll be no tears. There'll be no tears, no tears of them. Sorrow and pain will all have flown. And there'll be no tears. There'll be no tears, no tears of them. No tears in heaven will be known. Good morning, good morning. It's good to be here. It's good to see everyone. We appreciate so very much all who are in attendance at this time and those who will be coming in uh, shortly. And we're thankful to God for this being the first day of the week. <coughs> good to see everyone. Um, last time as I was here, we were studying. We were looking at uh, Matthew chapter 7. We were looking at the golden rule. And I wanted to kind of bring that back up so that we can look at a couple things because I think a lot of times – when people think about Christianity and people think about uh, people think about God and they think about doctrine, uh, they think about salvation, they think about hope and they think about worship and all of those things. Uh, but then there's another aspect of Christianity that we have to think about on a day to day basis. 
and that's how we uh, interact one with another, and that's how we deal with issues and problems. So let's, let's look at a couple of passages, because Jesus says in Matthew chapter 7, verse number 12, Therefore all things whatsoever you would that men should do to you, do ye even so to them, for this is the law and the prophet. And so when we think about uh, Christianity and we think about how we interact one with another, we need to understand that we have to be kind, we have to be compassionate, we have to be merciful, we have to be long-suffering, forbearing one another. Let's look at a couple of those passages along those lines. Thank, thank uh, Brother Johnson for filling in for me on last week and Brother Dowdy for preaching. Uh, we appreciate so very much uh, those men and their ability to stand before God's people. First and foremost, let's look at, look at Galatians chapter 5. Galatians chapter 5, you know, we often talk about the fruit of the Spirit. Galatians chapter 5, let's look at verse number 22 beginning. Notice now, in verses 22 through 26, uh, Paul is going to describe the fruit of the Spirit. In other words, that which the Spirit produces or the evidence of having the Spirit. And so he mentions love and joy and peace and long-suffering and gentleness, goodness, faith, faithfulness rather, meekness, temperance, against such there is no law. So, so when one thinks about the Christian life, we, we have to think about, number one, we have to think about ourselves. We also have to think about others. So notice now, he says the fruit of the Spirit is love. Love towards who? One another. And, and so when we think about the word love, um, agape, which is the highest form of love um, in the Greek language, we, we're talking about um, uh, the, the really is the idea of service, serving one another. Uh, uh, you know, love is more than just a word that we say. It's, it's an action word. Uh, joy. Do, do we have joy in our lives as Christians? What, what, as a matter of fact, what is joy? Um, it, it, it includes happiness, but it's, it's, a, it's a little bit more involved in that. Joy is a calm disposition. It's an it's a inner calm disposition um, that regardless of the circumstances, you still have faith and trust and dependency um, in God. So, so now, do we, do, we, do we always feel happy? And so sometimes, sometimes we are sad. Sometimes we are upset. Sometimes we are mad. Sometimes we are angered. But we can still have joy. And, and so when we think about joy, joy is, is, is more complex than happiness because sometimes happiness is fleeting. Happiness comes and goes. It, it, it goes in waves. If you don't believe me, all you got to do is watch sports. If you watch sports, you realize when your team is winning, you're happy, you're excited. But then you let, uh, 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 what's her name, get uh, 10 seconds left on the clock. You can't leave no seconds on the clock now with a uh, Kansas City quarterback. And, and so you let him march down the field and he, 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 he beats your team and he, he, you know, he takes your heart out. What does that happiness do? <laughs> Takes all the happiness out of you, right? Uh, uh, and, and so sometimes happiness is fleeting. And so joy is a little bit more involved in that. What about peace? Shouldn't you have peace within yourself? Shouldn't you be at peace one with, uh, one with others? Look, if you will, quick, look at Romans chapter 12. And so you can realize, you can see very easily, Paul in describing the fruit of the Spirit, he's talking about things that will benefit you as well as benefit other people. Romans chapter 12, start at verse number 17. Mm-hmm. He says, live peaceably with all men. Now, here's the thing. You can't be at peace with other people if you're not at peace within yourself. And, you know, one thing I find out about, about people and, 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 and family members and friends, you know, some people 
love to kick up dust. Some people love um, for, for there to be strife and turmoil. I, I mean, they just can't go a day without drama. Now, don't you know people like that? You got people in your family like that? You one of them, you one of them family members? Some, some, some people, I mean, they can't stand for everything to be peaceful. They got to be, they got to be doing something that cause some type of chaos and turmoil. But Paul says, live peaceably with all men. And so we, we need to strive to be men and women of peace. All right, so he says love, joy, peace, long-suffering. Can we suffer alone one with another? Can we do that? Did God do that with us? Huh? Sister Sharon said he's still doing it. Absolutely. Amen. We, we, we have to be willing to suffer alone. That's what the word, it literally means to suffer alone. Paul would, Paul would say in other places to forbear. It's the same idea. In other words, um, we, we got to give people time and, 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 and space to grow and, and, and to mature and to develop. Um, you know what? People don't come out their water, you know, ready to be fully equipped to be a child of God. People make mistakes. People fall down. They have their shortcomings. They have their failures. So Paul says, be long-suffering. And anybody who's a parent understands that principle very well. Your children can do some stuff and get under your skin. Those children can do something where you think you almost may want to kill them. Uh, but you got to be long-suffering. Paul says, love, joy, peace, long-suffering, what else? Gentleness. Got to be gentle. Gentle. And, and, and so notice now, we have to be gentle, soft, and, 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 and meek toward one another. You know, you ever, met, you ever met somebody, everything about them is just hardcore? They talk hard. They react hard. They love hard. I mean, just everything is so hardcore about them. And, and Paul says you got to be gentle. And, uh, 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 you know, when you think about it, you think about uh, when babies are born in the world. When babies are born in the world, aren't we so gentle with them babies? Uh, huh? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you, 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 you see the commercial. Boy, when that first child comes to the world, everybody's so careful and so gentle. I mean, you pass the baby along like this. and <laughs> Gentle. You, you be correcting folk. Not the second one. And, and, and the third one. <laughs> And so Paul says we have to be gentle one with another. So, so if we got to be gentle one with another, what does it take? Because we're looking at Matthew 7, 12. What does it take to be gentle toward one another? It takes love, but it also takes me putting myself in your position. As a matter of fact, if you drop down, look at Galatians chapter 6, verse number 1. We in Galatians 5. Notice now, this is in the same context, and, and so I always want to make this connection. When you look at the fruit of the Spirit in Galatians 5, 22 through 26, notice how Paul starts off Galatians 6 in verse number 1. In Galatians 5, he's talking about the fruit of the Spirit, right? Now he says in Galatians 6, 1, Brethren, if a man is overtaken in a fault, ye which are spiritual what has he just got through discussing having the fruit of the spirit how can you tell if somebody is spiritual they should demonstrate the fruit of the spirit but paul says in galatians 6 and verse number one he says um restore such a one in the spirit of meekness doing what considering yourself how would you want somebody to treat you how would you want somebody to talk to you? How would you want somebody to deal with you? And so when you think about it, love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, I would want somebody to be gentle toward me. And, and so, but if I'm going to be gentle toward somebody, if I, if I want somebody to be gentle toward me, I should be gentle toward them, right? So Paul says we have to make sure that we consider ourselves. Then he says goodness. Can we be good? Can we do good? And notice now, being merciful and gentle and good, that's not a sign of weakness. 
It doesn't make you a weak Christian. It doesn't make you an inferior Christian. That makes you a righteous individual. And that's what God wants. Notice now, Paul said we ought to do good. Look at Jesus. Look at Acts chapter 10. Acts chapter 10. Acts chapter 10. Notice verse number 38. Acts 10, 38. Jesus went about doing what? Doing good. Uh, and so when you think about Jesus and you think about his ministry and you think about Jesus' life, uh, uh, Jesus went about doing good. He was kind to people. He helped people. Um, he, he, he healed those who needed healing. He taught those who needed to be taught. He went about doing good. So to answer the question, what would Jesus do? He would do good. What should we do as Christians? We should do good. We should be merciful and kind and long-suffering and helpful toward other people. We should be like Jesus. All right? Then it says faith. Literally, it's faithful. We, 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 we got to be faithful. We got to be faithful as children of God. Now, we, when, when the Bible talks about being faithful, um, he's not talking about being perfect. It's really the idea of being consistent. We got to be consistent as the children of God. We got to be faithful. Not only that, Paul says meekness. What is meekness? Strength under control. As a matter of fact, go back to Numbers chapter 12. Y'all remember Moses? Moses was a meek man. Numbers chapter 12. Numbers chapter 12. Look at verses 1 through 3. Moses was very meek above all men upon the face of the earth. Moses was meek. Now, you think about Moses and, and Moses being the kind of man that he was. Um, when we first introduced to Moses in the very early stage of his life, what had Moses done? Moses had killed somebody. And, and so you think about Moses being probably a strong-willed individual, but when he met God. And he began to, to follow God. Moses became a very meek and humble person. And so that's what we have to be. We have to be meek and we have to be humble. Was Jesus meek? Sure he was. Look at Matthew chapter 11. The, the idea, and I think Quinn mentioned it, is, is strength under control. The idea of meekness is the idea of taming a wild horse. You take those wild horses and those horses, um, they hardly want to let anybody get on them. Hardly want to let anybody ride them. But if you're able to break that horse, break that strong, brute animal, and bring that strength under control, that's the idea of meekness. You know, we meet people all day, every day, who are strong, self-willed individuals. And so they have to bring that strength under control unto the control of God. Uh, Matthew chapter 11, verse number 28, what does Jesus say? Jesus says, come to me, take my yoke, and learn of me. What are we supposed to learn from Jesus? To be meek and to be lowly. Jesus was a meek individual. Now, you think about that. Jesus was God manifesting the flesh. Jesus was able to, 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 to bring in subjection, bring in control his power and, and his ability to do whatever he wanted to do, but he was able to bring in the subjection in order to do the will of God. And so that's what the idea of meekness is, being able to bring that strength under control. You got any children that are, that are strong-willed? And you can just about tell, you know what, that child right there, him or her, if I don't break them early, 
they're going to give me some problems. A and so we got to bring that strength under control, Sister Katrina. Well, the ideas is slightly different. Matthew chapter 11, Jesus said, I am meek and lowly. The idea of, of, of lowly or humble um, is the idea of, of bringing, um, uh, being made low. In other words, it's the, it's the, the antithesis or the opposite of, of arrogance. A and so a lot of times um, what we have to do, life will humble us, but we have to humble ourselves. So the idea of meekness is bringing strength under control, but in another sense, we can't be arrogant either. A and so when Jesus says he is lowly, he was humble. He humbled himself uh, unto death, even the death of the cross. So we have to be we have to be humble and lowly servants. We can't walk around thinking that the world revolves around us or that we the best thing since sliced bread. We gotta be we gotta be humble, and, and we also have to be meek. In other words, we can't always get our way. Everything can't always be about me. In other words, I gotta learn how to be able to bring my strength under control and at the same time um, uh, be 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 humble. Anyone else? Absolutely. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, um, Jesus said he could have called 12 legions of angels. We're talking about some 70,000 angels uh, to his aid, but he did not. Uh, and so Jesus followed through uh, with God's plan for his life, and that was to be crucified. Anyone else? Quickly, go look at Philippians chapter 2. Okay, so, you know, when you think about, when you look about Matthew chapter 5 with the Beatitudes, the Beatitudes in Matthew chapter 5 show us how to have a blessed life. And all of the things that are mentioned in Matthew chapter 5, and verses 3 and following, show us that if we have these characteristics, everything that the earth, that the world provides, we'll be able to enjoy, but we got to have this characteristic or this disposition. But notice now, in Philippians chapter 2, I want you to notice something. Look at Jesus. Look at Philippians chapter 2. We looked at this a couple weeks ago. Philippians chapter 2, uh, verse number 5. Notice he made himself on no reputation. I mean, he could have, but he made himself on no reputation. What else? Jesus took the, 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 the lowliest position on earth, the form of a servant, the form of a slave. And what else? Jesus humbled himself. He made himself lowly. And so he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death uh, of the cross. So when we think about being lowly and we think about being humble, we, we have a, a great example of Jesus and Jesus humbling himself and being obedient to God's will. John 8, 29 says, Jesus says, I do always those things that please the Father. So when we think about doing God's will, everything that we're mentioning in Galatians chapter 5 uh, will, will become easier if we strive to be like Christ. So we looked at love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, a goodness, our faithfulness, meekness, and what else? Temperance, self-control. That's what the idea, that's what temperance is, is self-control, self-discipline, self-mastery. If you will, quickly, look at Acts chapter 24. Can, can we all demonstrate self-control? Can I ask y'all a personal question? Y'all don't have to answer it. As it relates to self-control, what do you do when you're driving and you pass Krispy Kreme and that hot sign come on? You turn around? Huh? <laughs> Keep going. Some people don't. <laughs> Dunkin' Donuts. <laughs> Starbucks. Huh? 
Yo, like, start what? <laughs> and, and, and <laughs> Every, everybody got their vices, right? Uh, and, and so when you think about it, you know, whether it's food, whether it's shopping, whether, whatever it is, can we demonstrate self-control? And, and you know, whatever the vice is for you, whatever the thing that calls you, you know what, uh, got to be able to bring it under control. Acts chapter 24, uh, 24. Uh, through 26. Notice where Paul tells uh, Felix. Go ahead, Felix. Absolutely. Right. And, and, and it's hard even then, even when, when you're under doctor's order and your health is starting to deteriorate, to have self-control, um, uh, even to the degree, man, you realize how hard it is to 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 abstain uh, from from food that is not healthy for you, and it's crazy how how that works. You know what? You can say, you know what? I'm a, I'm a, I'm a going to diet. I'm gonna start. I'm gonna eat less. Somebody will call you and say, you know what? Um, I cooked some today. Uh, you want to come by and get a plate? And you already know what time it is. And, and so it becomes, it becomes so much more difficult when you're trying to do that which is right, even when your health is, is failing you. Acts chapter 24, and some people find it hard even then. Acts 24, 24, what, is Felix, what does Paul say to Felix? Uh -huh. Jewish. She was a Jewish woman. Mm-hmm. Know what is Paul's sermon? He reasoned of what? Righteousness, temperance, judgment. Tremble, Felix tremble at Paul's preaching. One of the things Paul mentioned as he was preaching to Felix was, Felix, you got to be able to demonstrate self-control. You got to be able to demonstrate self-mastery, self-discipline. And you think about how many people uh, uh, don't have any self-control. Not just eating, but in any part of their lives. They would give themselves over to any and everything. Paul said we got to be able to, uh, to demonstrate and exhibit self-control. Any questions or comments? But just. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. People, it, it's, it's selective. That's what you find out. It's selective. Self-control is selective uh, depending on whose company people are in. And that's, it's the same way you see people um, that claim they don't know how to dress. Let them go stand before the judge. They, they know how to dress then. They're going to go put on the best. Why? Because they want to impress the judge. And, and so we have to demonstrate self-control in every facet of our lives. And the same way with children. Children go to school and, you know, they acting up in class and they misbehaving. They do that in front of the teacher. They don't do that in front of the principal. They know how to demonstrate self-control. Hmm? Yeah, yeah. But people are selective in, in their ability to demonstrate self-control, whatever facet. So Paul says all of these things represent the fruit of the spirit. Uh, and so we're talking about having these inner quake, these inner traits and these inner qualities. But then go to uh, Colossians. Look at Colossians. Colossians chapter 3. Colossians chapter 3. Start at verse number 8. Colossians 3.8. Notice now, Paul is reminding Christians to remove these things from their character. Anger. So you think about that. Uh, as, as Brother Johnson mentioned, you know, some people are selective uh, in their self-control. You know, but some people are selective in their anger. He says, you got to put that off from you. You can't walk around and be angry at everybody all of the time. He says, you got to put off anger and what else? 
wrath. You, you, you know people like that, man, it seems like they can kill everybody they come in contact with. And we say sometimes, boy, if looks could kill. And so they're, they're filled with wrath. What about malice? Some people who are bent on doing that which is wrong, evil intentions. What about blasphemy? People speak bad against the church. They speak bad against government. They speak bad about everything. That's blasphemy. It means to speak against. What else? Filthy communication. We still making people eat soap? <laughs> Boy, they, well, you know what I was growing up. You couldn't, even, you couldn't even call about a liar. That was a bad word. Now you the child, let alone using curse words, profanity. And I mean, it's amazing. I mean, young, the, the, I mean these younger children walk right here and cussing. Not cursing, but cussing. Paul said, you got to put away from you filthy communication out of your mouth. And, and, and so we need to understand, we, you know what, words have power. Then he says, what else? Verse number nine. He says, now you got to put off all these other things, but you can't walk around here lying one to another. I said, I said, <laughs> I seen some, somebody said, man, you know what, some, some, a lot of people got that, that disease called liabetes. It just lie about everything. You know people like that. Some people can't. Some people can't tell the truth to say they so. They will lie about everything. One man has said, "You know what, man? I, I can't even trust when you say good morning, because you might be lying." And so Paul says, "Remove lying." And then what else? When 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 we were baptized. We were supposed to have gotten rid of that old man. And so he says, you put off the old man with his deeds, and so you need to put on the new man, which is create, created after Christ. Verse number 10, they have put on a new man, which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him. Then what does he say next? Scythian. Now notice, he just said, Put off these things and then put on what? Verse number 12. Put on bowels of mercy. Can, can we be merciful toward one another? Can we be compassionate? Can we be kind? Kindness and what else? Verse 13, he says, forbearing one another. That's an extended version of long-suffering. Forbearing one another and forgiving one another. Can we do that? Believe it or not, there are some circumstances, situations where people have gone 10, 15, 20, 30 years without forgiving somebody. For something that happened 30 years ago. And, and then you know what? People, people uh, wait. All that time passes, and then you realize, you know what, man, for 30, 40 years, we've been upset one with another. And you know why they were upset? Over something that was small and trivial and minute. So Paul says we ought to be forbearing with one another and forgiving one another. If any man have a quarrel against any, what we have to realize as Christians, sometimes we do have quarrels one with another. We do have issues that arise. But then he says, if any man have a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, so also do you. So we got to learn how to do what Christ did. We got to learn how to forgive. We got to learn how to be forbearing. Any questions or comments? Quickly, I want, you, I want you to see this picture. Go back to Matthew chapter, Matthew chapter 25. No, that, that's not what I, I don't want Matthew 25. I want the parable, Matthew uh, chapter 18. Matthew 18, as it relates to forgiveness. Matthew 
Matthew chapter 18. Let's start at verse number 23. Because some people act like they can't forgive other people. Some, and some people have selective amnesia as it relates to forgiveness. You always want God to forgive you, but can you forgive others? Matthew chapter 18, verse number 23. I'll start there somewhere. Ten thousand talents. Okay, so so if you take a note, write in your Bible ten million dollars. That's the equivalent of ten thousand talents. Ten million dollars. All right. Now he didn't have ten million dollars laying around. Anybody got ten million dollars laying around? Can can you go and put your hand on ten million dollars? You know anybody that, that got $10 million? You know anybody who will let you borrow $10 million? For as he had not to pay, where is he going to get $10 million from? He owed $10 million. But he didn't have nothing to pay with. What else? How you going to do that? How you going to pay $10 million? You have nothing to pay, pay with. And he says, be patient with me. Be long-suffering. Give me some time, and I'll pay the all. And so you understand, by his request, he just wants somebody to be patient with him. There's no way in his lifetime that he can pay off a $10 million uh, debt, not making a penny a day. Notice what else it says. The Lord was compassionate, and he forgave him all that debt, a $10 million debt, and he had nothing to pay with. But somebody was long-suffering, somebody was kind, and somebody was compassionate, and somebody was forgiving toward him, right? A $10 million debt. What else? Now, you remember, one of the things we learned earlier in the class this morning, we talked about considering thyself. Now, we got two men. Both were debtors. One owed $10 million and one owed $10. The man who had owed $10 million, he wanted his Lord, his creditor, to be com compassionate and forgiving toward him, and he was. He goes out and finds somebody that owes him $10. Don't you, don't you think... The man who owed $10, he wanted him to be long-suffering, forbearing, compassionate, and kind. But that's what he does. Took him by the throat. He going to make him pay him his money, his $10. Pay me what you owe me. Even if the man gave him $10, what is him giving him $10 going to do to his $10 million debt? Not even going to put a dent in it. But know what happens. I wonder if he had heard them words before. Sure he had. Because he ordered them in verse number 26. And know what it says. Wow. He would not. He would not forgive him the $10 debt. So, so think about this now as, as it relates to forbearance and forgiving. He owed $10 million. Somebody forgave him. Somebody owes him $10 million, $10, and he is unwilling to forgive him. Now, you would think the one with the greater debt would be the one who would not have forgiveness. But in this parable, the one who owed the least was not able to even find forgiveness. 
And you think about that many times. And you think about sometimes as it relates to the kingdom of God, how that, you know what, we can do what we say uh, we call bigger sins, those, those sins that are gigantic and enormous, and then somebody may say something the wrong way. Here you are, you have been forgiven of something more egregious, and here there, somebody may have said something unintentionally, but you can't forgive them. You see how the two works? But know what happens in verse number 30. I forgave you $10 million. Why? Because you asked me. Thou desire it. Verse 33 says what? And verse 34. You know why? Because there's a principle at play. A man or woman has to reap what they sow. And so when he was unwilling to forgive, and he was cast into prison because he, won, he wasn't willing to forgive. The conclusion in verse 35 says what? So likewise shall my heavenly Father do also unto you. If ye from your hearts forgive not everyone his brother their trespasses, wouldn't it be a terrible and awful thing for you to get to the judgment seat of Christ and find out that you're not going to go to heaven? Because you didn't forgive on earth. And so when you think about forgiveness, if you want God to forgive you, you better make sure you start practicing forgiveness with other people. Any questions or comments? No. No. As a matter of fact, uh, let's back up in Matthew chapter 18. Matthew chapter 18. Now, I'll tell you what. Go to Luke 17. Luke 17 explains it a, li a little bit better. Luke 17. Luke 17. Start at verse number 1. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, notice what Jesus says in the next verses now. We, we keep, that phrase keeps coming up. Consider yourself. Take heed to yourself. Notice now, take heed to yourself, what? Now, notice now, if your brother sins against you, and, and, and any time I uh, discuss these, I'll always use a personal example. Just say me and Brother Johnson get into it. Brother Johnson offends me or vice versa. If Brother Johnson offends me, it's my responsibility to tell him, rebuke him. Not all of the members of Clark County Church of Christ. <laughs> Not to put it on social media. Not send no subliminal shots to other people. No, it's my responsibility to rebuke him. And guess what? If he repent, then I do what? Forgive. Forgive him. And guess what? That's it. That's the end of the case. But what we do, people go all around the world to get to Athens. <laughs> people go on social media. They talk to their friends. They talk to other members of the church. They tell that, you know, with people who are going to listen to them and people who, 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 you know, who are in that corner before they go to Brother Johnson. And guess what? Next thing you know, now my wife looking at Sister Johnson, Brother Johnson crazy. They looking at my wife crazy. Why? Because I didn't go to him. I went to my wife. You know that pillow talk? <laughs> now we got families at ours. Why? Because we didn't do it the right way. And you think about it. That's how mess gets kept up in the church. 
because we don't have the things the right way. But he doesn't stop there. What else does he say? Now, I know somebody be saying, well, now, now, what is Brother Johnson doing? That he keeps sinning against the same person seven times in the day. Believe it or not, from a practical standpoint, it happens. The more you live with people, the more you deal with people, the more and more offenses come up. But guess what? In this scenario, Jesus said it doesn't matter how many times it come up. If we take care of the right way, if the person is rebuked and they repent, what's our obligation? To forgiveness. So you realize in verse 3 and verse number 4 that repentance precedes forgiveness. A person got to repent. Then what else? Now this is the reason why I wanted to read it from Luke's account. The apostles said, Lord, increase our faith. In other words, this was something that they had to wrap their minds around. Jesus, are you for real? Are you serious about this? You mean to tell me that if it happens seven times in a day, I got to keep forgiving? Sure you do. The Bible says they say, Lord, increase our faith. Now, here's the thing. Now, these are men who walk with Jesus. So Jesus forgiving people. And they say, you know what, Lord, you, you, you got to help me in this area because I don't know if I'm there yet. And, and so, you know, if they follow Jesus and they need their faith to be increased, I know some of us can struggle with forgiveness. And so, well, we got to work on it. Any questions or comments? Do you all remember, um, I think it was about, two, yeah, it had to be 2006. Um, do you all remember hearing about, um, I think his last name was Winkler, um, the preacher? Um, uh, I think his name was Henry Winkler. He's the um, grandson of Wendell Winkler. Um, his wife killed him. This is in the Church of Christ. It's 2006. You can look this up. And I remember um, his, his father, Dan Winkler, um, when I was in school, his father, Dan Winkler, um, was set to, to appear on the Memphis School of Preaching Lectureship when I was in school. And, I, and at this time, everybody was asking him, can, can, can he forgive his daughter-in-law? And he said, and I remember these words, he says, I can forgive her if she'll repent. Here's his daughter-in-law who killed his son. And everybody was wondering, can he forgive her? Can he, can he practice what he's been preaching? And I remember him saying, I can forgive her if she'll repent. And so that's exactly what Jesus is teaching. If a person will repent, we got to forgive them. Because that's what God does, doesn't he? When we come to God out of the world and we come out of denominationalism, we come out of all these different things, God is willing to forgive us when we repent. And so repentance has to proceed uh, of forgiveness. But what happens many times, what we end up doing, we like to forgive people prematurely without giving the opportunity to repent. No, you can't keep doing the same thing to me and then just expect for me to just wipe, you know, just slide it under the rug. You got to repent. You got to stop doing that. And so repentance has to proceed forgiveness. Any questions or comments? Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Brother Mitchell. Mm hmm Yeah, that's a good point. <laughs> right. Right. Absolutely. 
the movie. Absolutely. And, then, and, and even uh, with those examples, you even see some, sometimes the family will, will, will appeal to the judge on behalf of the offender if, if, if that person has, has showed some type of remorse. Uh, that, that situation where the family say, you know what, don't, don't give them the death penalty. Don't give them life, especially if it's a young, a young child, maybe 17 or 18, who committed a crime. Sometimes the family would be a little bit more lenient. Why? When they realize that the person genuinely did not intend to do this. So we, we, we got to be willing to show remorse, uh, and show some type of godly sorrow. Uh, to, the, to the example that Sister uh, uh, Glaze would mention, you can't just keep slapping me and just telling me to take it. Slapping me, slapping me. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. How will I know if you're sorry if you keep doing it? No, repentance, you got to change the behavior. Somebody has once said that the best, um, the best example of a changed life is changed behavior. When you know somebody has changed, you'll see it in their behavior. Any other questions or comments? Right. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm, absolutely. Right. Yep. Oh, absolutely. 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 Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And, and just as just as God tells us to be humble and meek, he also tells us to be strong. Be strong in the faith. A Quinn. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, and, and ultimately, um, when we think about forbearance, uh, uh, sometimes we have to be forbearing, uh, you know, and be long-suffering people until they repent. Uh, but at the same time, I'm just not going to let you just keep uh, sitting there punching me and slapping me and kicking me and just, and, and you thinking that I got to take it because I'm a Christian. I do not. Um, um, you know, well we, we have to be long-suffering, but at the same time, we got to be like Brother Mitchell, we got to use wisdom and use prudence um, and discernment. All right, I think our time is up. We'll pick this back up next week, Lord willing. Uh, Christians are not we people. Christians should strive to be like Jesus Christ. Jesus was not a weak individual. He was a meek individual, and we should, uh, we should strive to be like Jesus um, in our affairs and our dealings one with another. So we thank everyone for the kind of attention. Uh, let us have a word of prayer. We'll be dismissed uh, so we can prepare to go into worship. Our God and our Father who art in heaven, uh, holy God in heaven, we thank you for this day. We thank you for this class, all of the comments. And, Father, we thank you for your word, which is a lamp unto our feet and light unto our path. We just pray, Father God, as we read and we study and meditate upon our precepts, we pray that the things that we read and that we study, Father God, we can incorporate them into our lives, that we may be doers of your word and not hearers only. We love you and we need you. Most of all, we thank you for your son, Christ Jesus, dear God in heaven. It's in his name that we pray and ask all blessings. Amen.